thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, and welcome to Sacramento on this beautiful March day. Of course, March represents a change in seasons. It does represent the transition from the end of college basketball to the start of baseball, as we know. <laughs> And, um, you know, musculoskeletal defects and, and challenges are a real issue in athletics. But as we all know, they're an issue in all of our lives across the lifespan. As you can see from this slide, the number of, of procedures that must be performed annually in the U.S. that relate to bone deficits or bone fractures or slow and non-healing bone, those being bones that do not heal within an adequate uh, time period for the patient, is truly staggering. And here on the right, you can see, uh, if I can, there we go, here on the right, you can see that the cost of these procedures is absolutely enormous to our healthcare system. Not just for costs of treating these patients and costs in our insurance and reimbursement, but also costs to loss of work hours and quality of life. Now, the gold standard treatment for most bone defects in society is the autologous bone graft transplantation. So taking a piece of functional healthy bone from another site in the patient and moving it to fill a large defect or to bridge a slow and non-healing defect. There are other opportunities as well to address these clinical problems using biomaterials such as metals and ceramics, and here we have a total knee replacement. But what I wanna to emphasize to you today is that the gold standard is insufficient for many patients in California and United States. Specifically, we think about Roger Ebert, a very well-known, well-beloved movie critic who lost his lower jaw due to metastasis of a tumor. And after several, I believe four bone graft procedures, it was decided that he was not a patient that this gold standard would be effective. Intensive radiation therapy, resulted in the loss of vascularization and the inability of transplanted bone to graft effectively. Alternatively, we have patients, very young infant patients, who suffer from bone formation that's too rapid for normal development. In the disease process of craniosynostosis, we have premature bone formation in the soft spot of the skull of these kids. And without ample room for the brain to grow in the developing skull, this translates to significant uh, uh, significant challenges, developmental challenges for these children. And the only treatment for these kids is to remove large pieces of bone from their skull and then overlay the remaining pieces back in and hope that ossification or premature bone formation does not occur. Unfortunately, it does occur in a number of these infant kids. And so as engineers and uh, bioengineers, we're thinking about strategies to address these significant clinical challenges for both spans uh, of these patients. So bone tissue engineering has emerged as a potential option for the autologous bone graft. And as many of you know, mesenchymal stem cells can be extracted from bone marrow, fat, and other tissue compartments, expanded in the laboratory, and readministered or delivered back to the patient. As an engineer, we think about how we can control that presentation and maximize the ability of this cell population. So many in the field have taken to differentiating these cells in the laboratory toward an osteoblast, a bone-forming cell, and transplanting those cells back to the patient, or perhaps capitalizing on the robust ability of these cells to secrete potent tissue-inducing proteins and molecules that drive the growth of new blood vessels and recruit healing cells from the host into the tissue site. Here you see some recent images from my laboratory that shows and a mesenchymal stem cell that's stained in red in close co-localization with an endothelial cell in green. And these cells we know actively work to recruit and stimulate vascularization. So in my laboratory, we work pretty intently on developing biomaterials-based strategies to direct the behavior of mesenchymal stem cell populations. And we and others have taken to developing polymeric composite constructs that serve as an alternative for metals in implantation of patients. And the benefit of these materials is that they are fully bioresorbable, which is particularly great for pediatric patients. And also, we can control the physical properties of these materials very accurately. These materials are highly porous, which facilitate the ingrowth of new blood vessels and the migration of cells from the host into the defect site. And they serve as a temporary bridge or extracellular matrix in the bone defect. And so 
we and others have shown that these sorts of biomaterials are very effective at inducing differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells toward osteoblasts. And these materials can be effective in promoting bone repair in small and large animals. However, at UC Davis, we were the first to show that the composition of these types of scaffolds can directly affect the amount of, of tissue-inducing and vascular-inducing growth factors like vascular endothelial growth factor that are secreted by mesenchymal stem cells. You can see in these data that over time, the amount of VEGF was dependent upon the composition. And also, we can see that this amount of VEGF is sustained, secreted by the MSCs, is sustained over a one-month period. We are very pleased to see that in small animals, upon transplanting mesenchymal stem cells on these composite scaffolds, that this directly related to increased vascularization. Here you see these values on the top of the image represent a mass ratio of bioceramic uh, synthetic bone mineral to polymer. So as we increase the amount of bone mineral to polymer ratio, we see increasing amounts of new blood vessel invasion. And as we accelerate vascularization with this very natural procedure, this directly results in improved bone formation. So here we see three-dimensional high-energy x-rays of these scaffolds seated with cells just before implantation in the backs of animals. After eight weeks, we can see significant bone infill in all of these constructs, and this was directly related to the ability of mesenchymal stem cells to secrete VEGF and recruit uh, host vessels and recruit uh, cells that can participate in bone repair. Histologically, we can see that the presence of cells results in improved and greater tissue invasion compared to an acellular scaffold. So this biomaterial approach is very effective at transplanting cells, but as I said, these materials are serving as a temporary extracellular matrix. So these cells normally reside in an extracellular matrix in the body. And we know that this extracellular matrix plays a tremendous role in the activity and the behavior of these cellular populations. And we and others have spent significant amount of time looking at how we can control this microenvironment to effectively direct the behavior of these cells. Now the extracellular matrix is a protein polysaccharide collection of materials that provide critical cues to these cells. They provide sites for the cells to adhere to, they provide uh, instructional cues to tell the cells to differentiate toward a specific phenotype to grow and even to die. And so in my laboratory more recently, we've been thinking about capitalizing on the ability of mesenchymal stem cells to secrete an extracellular matrix. And perhaps we could engineer the composition of this extracellular matrix by controlling the specific culture conditions that we expand these cells in. And our goal is twofold on this work. Number one, that we can create a cell-secreted extracellular matrix that could then be transplanted and promote and accelerate bone formation in non-healing defects. And secondly, that we could create an extracellular matrix that when used as a coating for other materials could perhaps be used to slow down bone formation in infant children with craniosynostosis. And so this is a view of the type of material we're creating. Here's a view of the cells in culture stained with a Kumasi blue stain where protein stains as blue. When we rinse away these cells with a variety of detergents, we leave behind a complex protein polysaccharide mixture that we have since developed technologies to collect and deposit on a variety of biomaterials in a concentration dependent manner. And I'm very excited to show you these data that when we look at the ability of undifferentiated mesenchymal stem cells to form bone, to secrete calcium, when in contact with these extracellular matrices, we see some remarkable abilities. Compared to mesenchymal stem cells grown in osteogenic conditions on tissue culture plastic, where we see very little minimal red, when these cells instead are grown on our engineered osteogenic extracellular matrix, they produce tremendous levels of calcium at very early time points. Now similarly, we've been working to engineer this extracellular matrix to slow down bone formation for kids with craniosynostosis. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this disease state, these, the cells from these patients are characterized by an increased ability to form bone. And so here in the top left, we see a dual stain for markers that are indicative of bone formation by osteoblasts. And the more blue and dark purple and dark black you see represents more mineral. So here we see osteoblasts taken from kids with crani craniosynostosis 
compared to osteoblasts from unaffected kids, and I know you can appreciate a pretty striking difference in approximately one week in culture. Even after just three to four days in culture, these osteoblasts are already forming mineral deposits represented here in this bright field image where you see the, the bright white spots. Okay, so these cells are already capable of forming a lot of bone very, very quickly. I'm very excited to show you that when we take these osteoblasts and instead put them on our engineered extracellular matrix to slow down bone formation, the phenotype of these cells has changed dramatically. They remain very elongated and we see no mineral deposition. So we are able to slow down this process and we're currently looking at it, advancing this in small animal models. So overall, the, the area of tissue engineering seeks to commonly expand cells collected from a patient and either mixed with a biomaterial that can be used to transplant the cells back to the patient in a minimally invasive manner, or these cells could be deposited on an engineered biomaterial and grown in the laboratory for a period of time for subsequent implantation. So how can we capitalize on the ability of these injectable materials to still direct cellular behavior? And this is where we're leveraging our knowledge in engineering extracellular matrices produced by mesenchymal stem cells to further promote bone formation. So we use a variety of biomaterials, hydrogels derived from fibrin or alginate, or perhaps implantable materials derived from synthetic polymers or even collagen sponges. And one of the more popular materials for cell transplantation, as you know, is alginate, a natural polymer derived from brown algae. But alginate is, has the inherent disability that it cannot instruct cells of how to behave because proteins can't stick. So currently, we're thinking about strategies of, of applying our ECM in these systems. And the way we're going about pursuing this is we're taking polymeric microbeads that are now coated with our engineered extracellular matrix. And I think you can see some pretty uh, striking differences between these fluorescent images. When we take MSC, mesenchymal stem cells, and suspend them in alginate gels with uncoated microbeads, the cells remain dispersed throughout the gel. They're not interacting with any substrate. Instead, they remain quite spherical. Conversely, when we put extracellular matrix-coated microbeads in our gel with mesenchymal stem cells, now we see the cells are adhering quite well to the microbead. And remember, that extracellular matrix gives us the opportunity to include cell-derived signals to the cells. So as early as two weeks, when we look at the ability of these systems to generate bone in an ectopic site in rats, we see uh, the, uh, the uh, start of some early bone formation with gels that contain extracellular matrix coated beads. At six weeks, we see even greater mineralization. Um, and compared to the uncoated microbeads, we see very little mineralization. So indeed, the addition of this extracellular matrix provides a terrific opportunity to, to instruct mesenchymal stem cells to form bone. In collaboration with our outstanding School of Veterinary Medicine, which is adjacent to the biomedical engineering department at UC Davis, we work to investigate the ability of these hydrogel systems and other systems to promote bone healing in large animal models, such as horses. And here you can see in work in collaboration with Dr. Larry Galupo, we sought to address a bone cyst that formed in the left stifle of a thoroughbred racehorse. The animal presented with lameness and inability to run. And together with Dr. Galupo, we combined the horse's own mesenchymal stem cells with a novel hydrogel material and injected back into this bone cyst. And you can see that as early as 10 months, the bone cyst has completely disappeared. We've since replicated these data in five other horses, and we're very excited about this moving forward. And this opportunity represents a, a, a terrific collaboration at UC, UC Davis to advance our materials from the bench in biomedical engineering to large animal models, and then it's my pleasure to introduce my clinical colleague, Dr. Mark Lee. And working with Mark, we're now moving toward uh, taking our technologies and getting them to, you, to be effective to treat human patients as well.